welcome to the Power Platform Show. In today's episode, we have Chuck Ingham on the show. Now, he's the third time he's been on my show. He was there for episode one, the Dynamics 365 customer, episode 34, the Dynamics 365 and Adobe marketing. He has a lot of background in Adobe marketing. And now here we are for this episode, episode number 190. Full show notes for this episode can be found at nz365guide.com forward slash 190. What I love about the discussion I have with Chuck is this new model of engaging customers in the power platform in the Dynamics 365 space. Stay tuned if you're uh, looking for a job and you're an outstanding consultant, this is a company to keep your eye on. And then for customers that have, let's say, had less successful projects, I would advise you you get in touch with Chuck because what they're doing is pretty amazing. Anyhow, let's get on with the show. Hey, Chuck, great to have you back on the show again. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So your world's changed recently, right? You're you're starting (laughs) on a new adventure. What's that all about? It is definitely a new adventure. It's definitely a new adventure. We'll talk more about it, but you know, I, I can't believe I shouldn't say that I'm so surprised by how well it's going, but I am. <laughs> but you know, I think the message that we're sharing is resonating with people, that people want to get more value out of their CRM and ERP investments. And that's what we're all about. We're you know, and we'll talk more about it, but that's what this firm's about is success. I like it. I like it. Well before we start unpacking this new journey Tell us a bit about yourself. What's your origin story? How did you kind of get into this area of technology that you're in today? Sure. So I have been in the sales space since I got out of school. I had an accounting degree and my advisor, who was the accounting department head, pulled me aside in my beginning of my senior year and said, you know, you really shouldn't be an accountant. (laughs) <laughs> and and she introduced me to a couple people she knew you know one was her daughter and worked at Merrill Lynch and I met some more people that were in sales so I, I became a salesperson and I, I'm very like goals oriented guy so I wanted to live in Charleston I grew up in South Carolina I love Charleston so I got a job selling copiers in Charleston that was my first job you know no big consulting gig or anything like that I was literally a copier salesperson and, you know, it was really cool as I, I learned how to sell, not features, but what the client wanted to get out of the copier. Because if you've ever been to Charleston, it's not unlike Europe. The streets are cobblestone. So if you push these copiers down the street and then you <laughs> take it inside the building and, you know, a lot of the buildings have stairs, you know, it, it's not New York City. By the time you print out a page to do this copy or demo, it almost looks like that psychology test where you look at the blob and tell the psychologist what it, you think it means to you. So it, <laughs> so I kind of learned how to sell on outcomes a little bit more versus, you know, I'd carry the Wall Street Journal around with me and talk about, you know, how long do you want to own this and it's an investment and that kind of stuff. So, so I kept trying to improve what I was doing and I was working at a company called Milliken, which was one of the most amazing companies I've ever seen. It's a textile company run by like this titan. His name is Roger Milliken. And there's a book called Thriving on Chaos by Tom Peters that was written about Roger Milliken. And I, I got to meet Mr. Milliken several times and he wrote me a note, sent it to my house and stuff. It was really cool. While I was there, I was, you know, really tried hard and they had a great culture. And they did this little thing that I'd never heard of called CRM. And as much as I loved working at Milliken, I also, you know, I was a really young guy and I thought textiles may not be the place to be when I'm 60, 70 years old. And so they did this CRM and I, wow, I get this. Like, cause I was a salesperson and I probably wasn't the most natural salesperson. So I had to try hard to be a good salesperson. <laughs> so I remember I was in Nashville and I wrote on a little card in the Courtyard Marriott, one of the little note things, and I had just bought Microsoft stock. And I wanted to do CRM at Microsoft. 
And funny enough, I took a couple classes on technology at nighttime and I got a job with a small partner selling Solomon Software, SL. And within two years, I was working at Microsoft. And they didn't have CRM. <laughs> they had Siebel. But they did come out with Microsoft, what became Microsoft Dynamics CRM. And, and I weaseled my way over to help with that. And we sold some of the earlier sort of big deals with that. And there's a couple companies who's, you know, I don't think we ran them out of business, but I think <laughs> I think it was definitely a brand new product that we were working on. So I worked at Microsoft for, I think, nine years and grew with the product, worked with, you know, the biggest clients, you know, a lot of the biggest clients, a lot of the earlier, bigger clients. And then I went to a mid-sized partner. A couple of years later, went to HP, a really big company mm -hmm. and was involved with a lot of massive projects. I didn't do them myself. And then I went to a partner with a really amazing culture called Tribridge. And I really loved working there and got a chance to try a bunch of things that are kind of have informed what I'm doing now in a lot of ways. And it was acquired and I decided to leave and go to Avanade, another great firm. Went to Avanade, worked on some really big things there with some really smart people. And I decided to leave and start my own company. There's a big why behind that. That's a very positive why. <laughs> and it's really around people buying CRM. You know, I've been looking after CRM practices for you know, whatever, almost 20 years. And people are buying CRM like crazy. And then it seems like in the last maybe seven years, the CRM space has gotten a second wind. It seems like people are more, companies are more interested in customer experience. It's like nine out of 10 times your secret weapon is the way you treat your customers. So they're buying CRM for that to work. So great for all of us CRM people. The flip side of that is this whole flip of the coin thing, right? <laughs> so, you know, about half the time they don't like it and they're not satisfied. Maybe it didn't fail, but they weren't satisfied with it. So the more I thought about this over the last few years and the more I've played with it inside big companies and mid-sized companies, on one side it doesn't sit well and the other side there's an opportunity. Because in what part of life is 50% okay? Like, it, you know, the plane landing, you know, if the guy's skidding off the runway and you're, you're okay but you're really scared, that's not good. The commute to work... You know, maybe, you know, you come in and the car's got a dent on the fender and the, the hubcaps are messed up because you crawled a couple curbs and you just, you know, go to the procedure. I like to be able to tell my mom what I do. And if I tell my mom that I'm a doctor, I don't want the guy limping out half the time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, this is like 50% is not okay. And that's what Congruent X is about is getting to the root of why. 50% is not okay and how to make it okay. And the root of that is a lot of times, remember we used to say at early days in CRM, it's about people, processes, and technology, building them around your client. And it seems like over the time, it, there's a spinoff of customer experience and then CRMs become just a technology. And that's okay, but the problem is CX and CRM aren't always in the same conversation together. And we're trying to help clients get more value out of what they bought. And, you know, that's what Congruent X is all about, is bringing people and technology together to help drive outcomes. I like it. What I like, you know, particularly in, in our discussions that we've had so far, is you're taking all this 20 years of, you know, running practices in this space, very successful with, you know, some big name brands, you know, in your history, and you've decided to come up with a different model for your business. Tell us about how you see this model working and how, you know, what's your go to market plan with Congruent X? Yeah, good question. So I don't go too deep in it, but I like some of the things that Tony Robbins says. And one of the things he says is the quality of your life can be determined by the quality of the questions that you ask. So if you ask yourself, is 50% okay? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and this is what I do you know I know to have play the guitar a little bit and I know CRM so if one of the two things in my life is only 50% okay then you start to unpack well what's wrong with it well, what are the key constraints why is it not going well and you work backward from there so 
you know, if you kind of work back from good, what does it look like? It can't be just a project because what happens in a project is there's this collision between the desire to get over on the vendor, you know, so to speak, you know, let's be positive. I want to get the best deal as I can from the publisher. And I want to talk to the implementation company and smoosh the timeline and the cost down as small as I can. So there's this weird collision that happens where there's a whole bunch of features delivered over a short amount of time. And the users at these companies just aren't built to absorb that much change. So when you bought that many features, it ends up that you end up with a ton of unused unrealized value let's say and the people who are left to deal with this software once the consultants have left because they're fine with doing a big project really fast because that's the model is back up the bus have a lot of people come work and then go on to the next big thing exactly there's this valley of despair that happens <laughs> as the consultants say after the consultants have left and the users are starting to really struggle with all these features and we decided that that valley of despair is kind of an opportunity like if you go on the shark tank and you said all right there's a mr wonderful there's a 50 billion dollar industry and half the time people aren't happy with it and we think we can figure out how to make them happy mr wonderful will say huh well how could i turn that into a subscription <laughs> so we said you know maybe the client should look at, would work with us in a subscription model and our value ladder starts with an onboarding not a project you know well we still do projects but you know overall if you're gonna go on a trip with someone it's not a project it's a onboarding and then there's a subscription afterward and then that subscription would include three basic pieces one is support let's help the customer take care of what they have Two, help them optimize what they have and three, help them drive towards why they bought it in the first place, the business outcomes. Do I want to forecast the business better? Do I want to raise the efficiency level of my whole sales team? Do I want to prospect better? Do I want to take care of people that, that call into the company better? And how do you measure that? And that's what we want to do. And feels like so far in working with clients, and it feels like that. It feels like a client. It feels like a, you know, it's a different conversation. You know, it's a hug and when you see these folks versus a distant handshake and, you know, kind of your resources weren't ready for this phase and, you know, whether it's a task list here and, you know, it, it's a little bit different business model and we think it's going to be fun. You know, it's just going to be a different life. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I take it you're already onboarded some customers? We have. Yeah. Yeah. We've actually onboarded. And it's neat when we even say, tell the client it's an onboarding and we walk them through what the journey is going to be like. It's almost like there's less stress because it's not this big project. It's more how we're going to help you get more out of what you've already bought. And we're going to do it together. You don't have to keep our team busy 40 hours a week. We have other stuff to do. We're going to help you to the extent that you need the help in a planned fashion so it, it's a really really cool model and then the people that work on our team like it because you want to have this cool culture in your company people chase culture exactly and you want to have an amazing culture at your company but if you have a cool culture in your company and somebody's full-time at a company for two years that has not such a good culture they might leave because they're not living your culture. They're living the client's culture, which may or may not be fantastic. So if you're working on three or four or five clients, then you still kind of feel like you have the congruent X culture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. It's interesting, you know, that you're going in a different direction where, you know, if I look at a traditional consulting house, as you said before, you bid for a project, may come through RFP, RFI, that type of thing, or through outbound efforts, you actually identify a customer and they come on a journey with you and you sell them, you know, six months, 12 months, whatever length of project. And of course, you know, in any consulting crowd there, you know, their business model is to get as many bums on seats inside that customer's account, that that's going to result in billable, right? It is really 
you know, the more people you can put on a project, right, the higher the billable rate you can get off that project. And the customer sometimes feels like, you know, anytime they raise something new straight away, there's a, a CR goes in, change request, there's, you know, new bodies need to join the project, new level of expertise, and that rate is higher. And it does leave a taste of, are we on the project to bill as many hours as possible? Or are we on the project to deliver, you know, transformational outcomes for our client? And sometimes I feel a lot of clients feel like it's the former, right? The consult, you know, I've been in projects and one that comes to mind for me was a government project in Australia and a big name company had gone in there and built product X, you know, on the XRM, you know, platform within it. Another division inside that same organization wanted the same thing. I saw the two solutions. It was identical solution, yet they build them the same amount to build it from scratch again, because one division didn't know what the other division had asked for or built. They're separate, but, you know, and I was oh. just like, man, that just seems so immoral, you know, <laughs> as, as in they already had, it was on their own IT infrastructure. They could have just lit up you know, like a different business unit, you know, within the architecture of the technology and added licenses. But instead, they charged, you know, another six months of work to actually just build the same thing. No difference, no enhancements again. And you're obviously not going for that model, right? And of course, here's the flip side of this model is that staff, your staff, when they're consulting on projects like this, feel like if they are on the bench, if they do not have a project that they're on, that they're one step away from finding a new job. You know, it's very much <laughs> of a culture of if you're yes. not billable, you're a drain on the company. Therefore, you know, you could be bounced. How are you going to juggle under a congruent X's model these kind of constraints or that a traditional consulting company has been up against and has created, you know, as you say, you're being generous, I think, with 50%. I've seen stats as low as only 30% outcomes <laughs> are successful, you know, in these type of projects. So I think you've been generous. So what's your plan to address these kind of challenges, problems that have been seen in the market for years now? You know what's interesting is, and in, in you're totally spot on. One, when you try to explain this to some clients, we can talk more about it, but we figured out there are two primary avatars that we this conversation resonates with. If someone in a company is keen to get a big CRM project up and running because that's going to make their resume look better, they might not be our client, perfect client avatar. But if it's somebody who is kind of entrepreneurial and thinks that, man, I've got a really good sales team, but I've got five people who are awesome and 35 who are okay, but how could I imprint the really good ones on the the okay ones that want to try better and maybe this CRM thing could help me do that or I want to forecast the business better or somebody in IT that says man our screens have a lot of fields on it <laughs> not that that's what the RFP like you said you know the RFP always wants 150 fields on it I want a 360 degree view I want a you know heads up display and you know <laughs> and really if you listen to the way marketers tell you, you know, they're pretty good at getting people to buy stuff. And when you run an ad on Facebook or on LinkedIn and you click that ad, they're not taking you to 150 field form. They're taking you to four things, five things to get you to download the PDF or whatever. So there is a different way to do this and a different kind of buyer. And, and like, even if, like when I've tried to explain this idea, cause I've been thinking about it for a long time to people inside of other companies, they kind of say, Oh, you mean managed services? Well, not exactly. Oh, you mean advisory service? Well, not exactly. Oh, but people aren't going to be full-time on projects, and then the horse laughter starts. <laughs> but a couple things. One, there's a new Simon Sinek book. I really like that guy. He's got, yeah, a, new he's awesome. Simon, he's got a new book called The Infinite Game, and it's about having a long-term focus. So if we say we don't think 50% is okay. And we think that if we engage with the client over the long term, because that's when you get outcomes, you know, there's the project and then the how to helping them to use it better, take care of it, drive towards the outcomes. There's got to be a business model there that can be successful. So 
you know, we're getting better at improving it and building in automation and some apps and stuff like that. But when you start to drill into this and we start to unpack the numbers to a client, our goal is for the client to see 10x value. So we have some stack slide where we say, okay, there's this piece of it, there's this piece of it, and here's what you get, and here's what it's worth. And we want to credibly look at the client and say, you know, typically it takes three calls to resolve a case, if 150 bucks an hour, three people to work on it, and here's what a case costs, and here's what you pay us per month, and it's all included in your fee, plus you get all this other stuff. So it ends up adding up if they're paying us whatever, 5000 that we want to be able to credibly say to the client that you could get $25,000 worth of value out of this. So for the client, they start thinking, wow, this is a pretty good deal. And then internally, there are other businesses that work this way. You know, this whole consulting thing is kind of in this, in my opinion, in some ways, it's great. But on the other ways, there's a bit of a race to the bottom. It's like, you know, we found some more guys in, you know, this island that can do, we can teach those folks CRM and it's cheaper than this other place and it's cheaper than this other place and we'll have advantage in our supply chain. And I don't know how far you can go with that. Software's eating services, in my opinion. I didn't think of that. <laughs> Somebody else said it. But so if you have a model where you take customers over a journey and it's repeatable, there are companies already in other spaces that do this and they make really good money doing it more money than consulting companies do and you know you start thinking about you know i can only work 40 hours a week or you know for a little while i can work longer on projects but you know you'll burn out but if the value of what you're doing is not being measured to the client in a hourly rate and you're delivering value you know we're not measuring our success on chargeability we're measuring it on did the client get what they wanted did we make it easy? Are we good to deal with? Are we fun to deal with? And will they be an advocate? And did we make money working with the client? <laughs> and we have very aggressive profitability goals, and I think we're going to be okay. Mm, mm. I like it. Listen, one of the things you mentioned earlier there in your avatar persona is this word entrepreneurial. What do you mean by that? So I've worked for some really, really amazing bosses. And one thing that I found is when I worked at companies where it kind of felt like you were in your own company, but were guaranteed a paycheck, but you got to do cool stuff and kind of do special projects and things like that. I, I worked with a guy named Rob Lang, who was my first boss that I felt was, you know, kind of freed up an entrepreneurial spirit. And I had a bunch of other really good ones. And then Tony Benedetto at Tribridge, that was just kind of part of his spirit at Tribridge. He actually used to talk about entrepreneurial spirit. You know, we're a company, but we want to be a company of a bunch of entrepreneurs that feel like it's so many people go through their life. I think it was 90,000 hours you work. And so many people go through just, you know, get in a car, drive to work and drive back home and do what they tell you to do. And it's no fun and those companies are not as productive as companies where the whole stack of people are trying to solve problems like Mr. Milliken I was talking about earlier and you know he never used the word entrepreneur but I think he probably would have used it if it was in vogue when I knew him or had met him but he used to draw this thing on the board because he wanted people to tell him what the real deal was and he wanted people to come up with ideas and he would put himself at the top of this triangle and he said because my dad founded this company in 1865 or whenever it was <laughs> and he was like eight in his 80s when I had a chance to work with him or for him and he said I'm at the top but the best ideas come from this big fat part of the triangle so I think when people are entrepreneurial, that's fantastic. And so for us, in our number of at-bats we've had so far with our firm, it feels like that the people who are entrepreneurial, our clients that are entrepreneurial, that the people who want to go change stuff, those are the folks who will embrace this kind of a model. The people who want to take a big project live and put on their resume, maybe not so much. So you and I have talked about, we have two avatars. One is a, 
VP of sales who's entrepreneurial. And I have a good friend, Kevin Armstrong. We don't work together. We used to, but we still will always be great friends. He's kind of informs one of our avatars because he's a super VP of sales. He gets everybody fired up. He understands 75 different sales methodologies and all that stuff. But he also cares when the CRM doesn't work. And he cares when the HR people take too long to pay a bonus. And he doesn't go run and try to go yell at people, goes and tries to, let's figure it out. You go get a beer and, you know, we change the way the screens look so that it's easier for the rep to keep up with the CRM so the forecast is better. And same thing on the IT side where maybe it's not the CIO. Everybody says go in as high as you can and you should. Sometimes the CIO is is such a high level, they're not going to be as entrepreneurial or maybe they will be but we found that somebody a notch below that that maybe they go to the power platform Saturday like we had one Saturday in Tampa and they come back and they get fired up about what the power platform can do and they see we've got these sort of monolithic enterprise applications like CRM but I could go to the sales department and help them come up with power apps to help their forecast. I can go to the shipping department and help them do their quotes better. I can help, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the person that seems to embrace this message. And so it's kind of a part of our spirit inside of this company that we're trying to build. And it's our ideal client profile. As I well. like it. I like it. Another thing you mentioned earlier on there was around culture. And, you know, one of the things that Tribridge was known for was an incredible culture from, you know, the grad or intern programs that you would run and the kind of journey that you would take somebody from zero to really hero within your business over a period of time. People love working for Tribridge. I've met so many former Tribridge employees that just raved about that business and then, of course, have had contrasts of other companies that they've worked with and which I find interesting even leads into the fact that you're starting a new company. We've seen a massive amount of consolidation across the market in the last two to three years. And now, you know, you're, I think, the second or third business I've talked with recently that is a new startup, building new practice, taking advantage of new opportunities. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this as, you know, and it often, it's these are the cycles of consolidation. But back on that culture front, tell me, You know, they often say a good CEO is really good at understanding that their staff are actually their customers, and then the customers are actually customers of their staff. And so the importance of looking after your staff, how are you going to build that into your culture? It's going to be all about the team. You know, quote Tony Robbins again, and I actually remember saying this to Tony DiMenedetto once, and the strength of a company is the strength of the ability of the team to walk out the common vision of the CEO, you know, the CEO's energy and vision of the firm. And we all were kind of around these set of values at Tribridge. It was like entrepreneurial spirit, servant leadership and things like that. And everybody just knew them and could rattle them off. And (laughs) so it's that vision around how we take care of each other inside of the company. And, And you, you and I talked about it's, you know, we're more about people, not resources. And we're more about outcomes, not projects. And we're not focused about hours. You know, (laughs) let's focus on outcomes instead of hours. So that's a big part of this. And the second thing is everybody thinks that different people think their skills are different. I've figured out that I'm pretty good at a few things, but I'm awfully terrible at some others. But It's so interesting when you can find a group of people that you can work with and go, wow, I stink at that, but that person is amazing. (laughs) And so diversity in every sense of the word is a big part of what we hope that this culture will have. So we want people that you know, look different. We want people that think different too, because usually if I'm okay at something, and I'm terrible at something else, we can find someone who loves the thing that you're terrible at and it just lifts the whole enterprise. And so, you know, finding what people love to do and pouring them into that versus nobody ever got in the Hall of Fame by being pretty good at everything. You know, let's let's find what people love to do 
and pour them into that. But that's a big part of what we're up to. I like it. I like it. You're going to have a, a bunch of people, a bunch of consultants wanting to knock on your door and come work for you <laughs> under this model. It started happening quite a bit. As fast as we can onboard the customers, we're going to talk to a lot of, I'm sure, talk to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So exciting. So just tell me a bit more. What can you share more around your subscription model? You know, a couple of models that jump to mind that I've seen in the industry you know, is the one that Triburge would do at the conclusion of projects. I had some insight into that. Then the other I've seen, you know, there was a company some years ago, back in the early days of CRM expanding that my understanding was the subscription model. So they would say, you know, you get all of this, we will continue to update the technology and we share it amongst all all our customers. So as we do new releases, we'll roll into your environment, we'll create a massive amount of training so that, you know, everybody based on their role and how they're interacting should be crystal clear on how to do their role. What are kind of going to be the key pillars of, of how your subscription model will work? No, it's all good. We've kind of built our own framework and what we've tried to build it around is is stuff that we found that already works. So we didn't invent it all. We kind of married a few things together, but it was it's stuff that we know works. Like there's a consulting organization called TISA, and they wrote the technology as a service guide handbook and B4B book. And I think they had one other, but anyway, they have this framework where how to get to outcomes and is basically level one, two, three, four. And level one is a company makes products. And then, you know, that you can think of that as Microsoft. Level two is products and services. You know, you can you think of that as, you know, like a big SI or something like that. And level three is product services and adoption and optimization services. And that's kind of what we started to do at Tribridge when I was there and, and what this offering, you know, starts people down the road to. And then the last one is outcome based. And so it's kind of like you can't skip to the last one. You have to help our client take care of what they bought, make it better, and drive towards a goal. And so you and I were talking about, a lot of folks have seen the new cars. Almost all the cars have some kind of steering assist now. And you know, if you've ever ridden in a Tesla, it's a little scary at the beginning, but the way it works is you can even push in navigate home. And it knows that your house is at, you know, in outside of Atlanta for me, but it's constantly making little course corrections and it's constantly looking at what's not working. So it, it'll even suggest that we change lanes if there's a big truck that's going slow in front of us. And if you think about it, the normal project based approach, it's almost like you steered the car towards your house and you stopped, you know, there's no autopilot that you just hope that it goes in a straight line and makes it there. There's no science behind that <laughs> that works. So there's that is a pretty good framework. And then, you know, our onboardings are two kinds. One, when a client, you know, maybe they have salesforce.com and they don't like it and they want to switch to Microsoft or they had spreadsheets and want to sw switch to Microsoft Dynamics. That's fantastic. There's another model where they already have it and they just want to make it better. And there are frameworks that you can use and we like design thinking and we like the theory of constraints by the gold rat because it works. You know, it works in a manufacturing plant so you can look at the way that people are using things and Look at the objective, you know, you want the Tesla to get you home <laughs> and look at the constraints. There's a big wreck on Interstate 75 and we're going to navigate around that and put the constraint right up front, right? That's the what theory of constraints does and use design thinking for a couple reasons. One, it's fantastic, but two, it's really good at, at helping it become everybody's idea so that you're not the consultant that comes in and has an idea and everybody's pushing back on it. It becomes, you know, you may come up with the same solution that you had before, but it's everybody's idea. And then there's the concept of constant course corrections of that autopilot, you know, kind of looking at where the lines are on the road and where the traffic is and making those constant course corrections towards that ultimate outcome. And for us, there's based on what the client wants to accomplish, there's a cadence that we go where we're, con we're coming back. 
to the client. It could be every quarter, every you know, twice a quarter. It could be twice a year, where we're making those course corrections, seeing how we're doing relative to those outcomes. So you said you wanted to forecast the business better. You were at 25% forecast accuracy in Las Vegas. The craps table is 49%. We still have some room to go. <laughs> and your goal was 50%. So let let you know. Let's see how we're doing. And and we built an app that tracks the outcomes, and we can go back to the client and kind of work with them on that. So that's our framework that we do. And we have this five week thing that we can do for folks who already have CRM is kind of five weeks to congruent CRM and we made a PDF out of, that we send people out when they take a little quiz on our website that's a good starter kit. I love it. I love it. It's interesting you talk so much about design thinking there because, you know, we've seen Microsoft massively ramp in this space with their service offering. Alyssa Taylor came out with a video at the start of last year or earlier on last year with their version of design thinking and they're, they're starting to scale it out across the bigger partners at the moment. And like, I'm just seeing it in every conversation, you know, how design thinking is now used more and more with project onboarding, with, with requirements gathering, all those type of things that you do with the customer. The tools offered within design thinking, I think are amazing. And it's interesting to see it take off. Absolutely. Well, you know, we've cranked through some time here. Let's jump into some. <laughs> Why are you laughing? You ready for the interesting questions? <laughs> we talked before there was a quick fire question or something. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Here's the quick fire. Okay, here you go. Would you rather watch a movie at home or at the movie theater? Movie theater. I have a subscription for the movie theater. <laughs> how, how easy was that? <laughs> what was the hardest decision you've ever had to make? Hardest decision I ever had to make. I had to stand behind my values because I told my son his entire life that if you do what you love to do, that'll be the right thing to do. You'll never hate your job. And when he was in college, he had a scholarship at a university and he's a musician and he decided he didn't want to become, not that this is a bad thing, but he didn't want to be a marching band guy or or music teacher and he went to a different kind of school to be a recording engineer slash producer and that was a big cost to that shift <laughs> there was a scholarship at one and no funding for the other but you know we had to stand by what we said we said that this is whole life that you should pursue your dreams and you're going to spend all this time as work you might as well do something you love and so, you know, we owe a little money, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what would your rap name be? My rap name? Oh, <laughs> I was always an 80s rock guy, so. So mix a lot? Who, who you know, others? something Van Halen, CVH or something. Okay. I like it. I like it. <laughs> what was the wildest party you've ever been to? I can't talk about it. <laughs> so, very good, very good. So I like I, that. No, I mean, you, you, you. <laughs> so I, I used to play in bands and I went to biker rallies a lot and I went to Daytona Bike Week. I played there a couple times and those people have a really good time. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> if you could go back in time, what's one thing you would tell your teenage self? I think that I'm going to say you should start a company when you're 35, not when you're. 55. <laughs> <laughs> What's one book that has made the biggest impact in your life? I love the Thriving on Chaos book, but I think the one that Membership Economy. I had a chance to meet Jeff Lynn, who used to work with us at Tribridge. He introduced us to the author of that book, Robbie Kellerman Baxter. And she probably thought I was a weirdo because when I met her, I just followed her around everywhere. But I wanted to ask her a lot of questions. But I think that the Things are we're moving from from the old way to this, you know, people just want to have experiences and outcomes. And I like that one. And I also like the Ray Wong disrupting digital business. But I think the pivot came from Robbie's book. Mm -mm. What I find interesting is I know that that membership economy, you gave that as your answer in the very first uh -huh, place you did. The wheels were turning at that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the reason I know, because I went and read it afterwards. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And I always find when I have conversations with you, even earlier this week at a conversation, you mentioned a book and I'm now halfway through it, reading it. <laughs> I, I went and got me a copy and I like this. It helps inform my education all the time. Anyhow, 
Before I let you go, who would you recommend as a guest for the show? Who's kind of like a real rock star in our industry that you think would be awesome to get on the show? Outside of the industry, I think Robbie would be neat. Robbie? Yes. Okay. Are you going to do an introduction? <laughs> I will. Yeah, let me do that. Excellent. That would be epic. Anyone inside? Inside the industry. You know, it's funny. Chris Cognetta, and you know Chris. I know him well, yeah. It was maybe like five years ago. He picks up his phone and says to me, your future looks like this. And he was just looking at the screen that had a whole bunch of apps. Mr. Milliken always said, steal shamelessly, but give credit. And what I think about power apps and a lot of what we're doing in this new firm was informed by what Chris told me that day. I don't give him full credit because, <laughs> you know, contextual experiences is what I think people are going to look for. That is so cool. And Chris has been on the show a few times, but yeah, I think I've got some interesting things to talk to him about in the future. Chuck. <laughs> It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. If people want to connect with you, they want to check out your new company, they want a job, <laughs> <laughs> where can they track you down? Our website is congruentx.com. How do you spell that? C-R-U, congruent. Mm -hmm. And then just with a capital X, right? So it's C-O-N-G-R-U-E-N-T-X.com. Yeah. Con congruent X. .com. X. So we like X because one of our videos has congruent and then the, it changes. It, people fills in the X and then, you know, technology fills in the X and then experiences, outcomes all, fills in the X. So it's kind of like, yeah, congruentx.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. And Facebook is more like my old rock star days. But <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Awesome. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Mark. Hey, thanks for joining me on today's Power Platform show. For full show notes, please go to nz365guy.com forward slash 190. I'm your host, Business Applications MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 Guy. If you have a guest that you would like to see come on the show, feel free to reach out. LinkedIn Messenger is the best way to get hold of me, so send me a private message there, and let's explore that together. Bye for now.